world. You know, by the time you're old, you've had so many bad experiences, one more bad experience just doesn't stand out that much, right? You know, you'll get over it. So there's a bit of that. Um, there's also some evidence that there's a biological component to this. Um, Andrew Oswald uh, did a study of apes, I'm not lying, and it was published in Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences on cheerfulness in apes, and apes also experience a youth, have a youth curve in the middle age point. And then most recently, Blanche Lauren Oswald and then myself, in different sort of parallel studies, have been looking at the use of antidepressants or reported mental illness in the US, Britain, and China, and the inverse U, so that reported mental illness and antidepressant use is the highest and about where the U is the lowest. And then finally, we just looked at stress around the world, reported stress yesterday, and we find across countries there's this inverse U again. It turns out, looking across countries, there are a couple of dimensions. So happier people, if you look at the quantile of the well-being distribution, so where people are in the well-being distribution, happier people turn earlier, right? They're more likely to have their youth in the sort of early 40s, and the least happy people turn later, sort of late 50s or even 60s. Happier countries have an earlier turn, in general, than some of the least happy countries. So Russia, which also happens to have low life expectancy, turns very late sort of mid-60s, and life expectancy for males is 50, so that's not a great story. So what we're finding is that happier people and people in happier countries actually have more happy life years. There's sort of no justice to that story, but maybe this is what it is in the world. Age. Within countries, we know income matters. It's not the only factor, but it does indeed matter, and everywhere we look, um, people who are, have more means are happier than people who are destitute. Health matters usually more than income if you're putting relative weights on the coefficients. Employment, everywhere we've studied, unemployed people are typically less happy than employed people. Um, marriage is a tricky one because everybody, you know, you get these cross-section findings and everybody says, well, married people are happier. Um, but it really isn't uh, the effects of marriage per se. They don't seem to last that long, and Andrew Clark will talk more about that. But it turns out that people, it's because happier people marry each other, right? So that when you pick up in the cross section, you picked up these people who are naturally happier um, the innate traits or whatever it might be. Um, and the, the lasting effect of marriage is what, a year or two, Andrew? About 18 months. Yeah. There you go, 18 months. And there's a great um, article by Claudia Senek and a colleague called You Can't Be Happier Than Your Wife. And they use panel data and find that the probability of divorce is highest when there are asymmetries in the happiness levels of the partners. So it's better to have two happy people marry to each other, or two unhappy <coughs> people marry to each other, but you don't want a happy person married to a happy person. It doesn't work. I can tell you from my own experience. And I was a happy person. Um, friendships are a little bit the same way. You know, so we always find that there's some positive coefficient on friendships socializing, but it turns out happier people are more likely to friends and to socialize. Religion's a little bit the same way. Um, gender, um, Sonia Chattopadhyay, who's also here in I, um, I don't know what he is, but he's <coughs> did a study of gender and well-being around the world, and we found that on average, women were happier than men. Um, but not in places where gender rights were severely compromised, which is not a surprise, but also not in places where gender rights were in flux, even for the better. So this change in gender rights may in the long run produce better things for women, but in the short run probably produces inner household tensions and all kinds of other things. And there have been a couple, there's been a study by um, Alois Stutzer on this in Swiss, in Swiss cantons that voted for group gender rights or not. So yes, almost a natural experiment. So given that we know all these things, we can then look for, you know, these patterns are fairly consistent, you can look at all these things that vary, and then presumably apply the answers to policy. But I mean, this comes from what I think is now very broad agreement among scholars on two on these two related but distinct dimensions of well-being, evaluative and phenomenon. So Jeremy Bentham's concept of well-being was maximize the contentment and pleasure of the greatest number of individuals as they experience their lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, in other words, hedonic or experienced well-being. And then um, Aristotle's concept of happiness, eudaimonia, um, and I've seen it spelled with an E and an AI, and I don't know what the right spelling is, but um, both seem to pop up. If anybody has strong views, let me know. But it's a Greek word that combines two concepts, you meaning well-being or abundance, and daemon meaning the control of an individual's destiny. And so that, I think, broadly wraps up the 
evaluative well-being. And I think evaluative well-being, when you think about satisfaction with your life as a whole, um, implicitly includes people's opportunity to lead a purposeful and meaningful life if they so choose, right? People's opportunity to choose the kind of life they want to lead. And then it has, I mean, there's sort of a normative assumption, at least Aristotle makes, that it should be purposeful or meaningful. At the least, I think people should have a choice that would be purposeful or meaningful. And more recently, um, some uh, people, Paul Nolan in England, Milena and I have done a little bit of this, have been trying to measure eudaimonic well-being more explicitly. There's a question about meaning or purpose in life in the British National Statistics Survey. So we're starting to know more about how eudaimonic measures track. They track very closely with life satisfaction measures, but with some modest differences. Um, so eudaimonic well-being metrics are better for assessing quality of life and life at the moment. Right? Um, they're particularly good, for example, for end of life care decisions when you aren't trying to make somebody's life more fulfilling or better. Um, you're just trying to make their daily experience okay, right? And the endonic metrics are great for figuring out the effects of different caregiving arrangements or other things when you're no longer talking about making decisions about expanding, uh, extending people's lives. Um, the value of well being is better for assessing people's capacities to make choices and to seek fulfilling lives. Um, and there are big differences here, I think, is where when you look at, uh, for example, think about the Easterland um, paradox scatterplot. If you do that with hedonic metrics, you get almost no pattern at all across countries. So there really isn't a cross country pattern that's smiling. Um, a little bit more of one in stress and anger, just because countries that are violent and horrible to live in tend to have more stress and anger. Um, so, um, Basically, when people, people have very limited means, I think it's harder for them to have choices of their life and to achieve the value of well-being. Um, it's in relative terms. More money won't give you better moods, it won't make you smile more, it won't make you enjoy your friends more. But money does correlate much higher, I think, in matter with life satisfaction or value of well-being because more means give people the choices to lead the kinds of lives they want to lead. Um, so it turns out that on this dimension, and I've done some work in Latin America also showing um, the importance of these different dimensions <coughs> across foreign rich people in the courts of San Juan. But I want to turn briefly to some work we've been doing on the United States and about very huge differences. So this is a comparison where we compare average levels of stress in the United States with average levels of stress in Latin America and how those differ across the poor and the rich. And we did, we broke down Latin America into specific countries to make sure this wasn't driven by particular countries or particular kinds of countries, and it's not. So the average really is capturing a pretty, um, pretty, uh, you know, shape <coughs> average. So what's interesting here is that people in the United States experience much more stress on a daily basis than people in Latin America. But what I'm focusing on is the difference between the rich and the poor. And it turns out the difference between the rich and the poor in the United States is much greater than in Latin America. So the poor in the United States are experiencing a lot more stress than the rich in the United States, a lot more stress than um, the poor in Latin America. <coughs> there's a lot of work on stress now showing the negative long-term effects of a lot of stress. It leads to short time horizons. It has bad health effects. It's very difficult to plan ahead, invest in your future, do anything if you're under a lot of daily stress. And it turns out that it even has biological implications. People start to react differently, and they have difficulty making cognitive, you know, difficult cognitive calculations. Um, so stress is basically a pretty bad thing. Um, the question which proxies for belief in the future, faith in the future, is do you think that hard work will get you ahead? Um, and if you look at this, it's remarkable. <coughs> you think about this question as sort of a proxy for the American dream, you know, we all <coughs> we put up a lot of money because everybody who works hard can get ahead. But if you look at this, the poor in the United States scores significantly lower than the poor in Latin America. The rich in the United States scores significantly higher than the rich in Latin America. And um, so it's not good news for the American dream. And on the, sort of at the top end, I think there is kind of like, well, of course you're going to believe the hard work gets you ahead if you're ahead because you want to believe the hard work got you there. So there's kind of a self-fulfilling belief um, thing going on at the top. Started looking across US MSAs. Um, which are bigger than zip codes and smaller than states, and inequality measured by the Gini coefficient, and incidents of stress, of worry, and other things. And we find to be that um, there's a positive correlation between reported stress and inequality across MSAs, and it's primarily driven by, by the poor, right? It's a, it's a stronger correlation for the poor. 
We also found that there was a negative correlation for reported social support. Do, uh, do you have friends or family you can rely on in times of need? This is from the Gallup Healthways, so it's a thousand Americans a day, every day for several years. Um, and so here what we find is that not only the poor report less social support in uh, more unequal NSAs, but so do the rich. So there's something about highly unequal places that seems to be bad for social cohesion. Nick Christakis just did a wonderful experimental study with experimental social networks and found <laughs> physical inequality. So if people knew how much people in their network had, um, they were much less likely to cooperate and were much less likely to be willing to contribute to public goods for the group. Um, so there's something about inequality, at least at extreme levels, that seems to be bad for social support, social cohesion. Um, Last thing on this, we also looked at respect yesterday. And so the rich were more likely, in more unequal MSAs, the rich were more likely to report they had been treated with respect yesterday, but the poor were not. Um, so more to come on this. I'm doing a ton of work on this. But it's, I think it's an example of the kind of things that well-being metrics pick up that just standard income metrics might not, um, which is indeed, of course, relevant to policy. So now some puzzle countries with higher levels of GDP per capita. But you get all these other you know, things. So my happy peasants and frustrated achievers, which I found over and over again, where you find upwardly mobile people who have made very big income gains, who report to be unhappy or frustrated with their situation, and poorer people who have no income change report to be very happy, right? Part of it is the process of change and uncertainty is an unsettling one. And all of a sudden, reference norms change and other things. Um, so, uh, we also find what we, something called the paradox of unhappy growth. When you look across, do a cross section of countries around the world, you find that, again, on average, people with countries with higher average per capita GDP have higher levels of well being. But people in countries growing very rapidly tend to be less happy. China is a classic case. Um, again, something Andrew Clark can help me out with. He just edited a whole book on China and inequality. Well, well pretty close. So be careful. Well, whatever. Anyway, um, but we find life satisfaction dropped dramatically in China at the same time that growth went up dramatically. Um, mental health reports, suicide rates, all kinds of things flew up at the time that China was growing so rapidly because very rapid growth is an unsettling process. Um, but that, to me, also begs the question of causality. So some uncertainty is often necessary to achieve progress, so do you need frustration and unhappiness to underlie the development process? And I don't know. We've been doing some work, Milena and I, and she's done more since on when you find you know, that migrants are less happy than non-migrants in their place of destination. Well, maybe they were less happy before they migrated. Maybe they aren't unhappy because of where they are. Maybe they were less happy before. We find that, indeed, for some places, that's the case. Um, so we've been just, uh, just two more slides, and I will wrap up. Um, this, this is some of the directions we're going with this. One is this whole idea of different dimensions of well-being and a major change, and what's the direction of causality? Right? Do you need unhappiness or frustration or stress <laughs> to cause change? Um, then also, I've been doing a lot of work on the different well-being dimensions, future outlook, outlooks and discount rates, right? So people who are very limited in their capacity to think about the future, lots of stress, what's their time horizon, and how does that affect their investments in the future? And how does that operate in a context, say, like the United States, high levels of inequality? And then lastly, some really um, new stuff that I find super interesting, um, still very much work in progress, um, is do people have different behaviors depending where in the well-being distribution they are? Right. So some of the, uh, Milena and I found, using Gallup data from around the world and quantile regressions, that the happiest respondents seem to value income and employment the least. It matters least to their well-being. But learning and creativity much more, versus the least happy respondents value money much more. The least happy respondents, and some work Martin Binder has done, show that they're also much less resilient to things like unemployment. Um, so there's a question of, so what does this imply for behavior? We're thinking about <coughs> You know, what does well-being cause? Why does it matter? Why should it matter in the policy realm? Um, I think it's also important <coughs> to distinguish between sort of what the average levels of well-being results in. We know, you know, better health, more productivity, lots of things on average. 
But these outliers of the, of the extremes of the distribution may be quite different, and I think we need to know more about them. Okay, so um, the train's left the station, and we'll see where it goes.